We're going to introduce an important class of matrices called orthogonal matrices. In this video, we'll look at the definition, some examples and basic properties, and two theorems, one of which we will prove. The video has chapters, so you can skip around as you please. Beginning with the definition, we say that a square matrix A is orthogonal if its transpose is also its inverse. So A inverse equals A transpose, and hence we would have that A times its transpose is equal to the identity. And of course, A transpose times A is equal to the identity. If we view an orthogonal matrix as a matrix transformation from Rn to Rn, we call that an orthogonal transformation or an orthogonal operator. So the definition is straightforward. A matrix A is orthogonal if A transpose is the inverse of A. Let's look at some examples. Here's an example of an orthogonal matrix. We can see that it's orthogonal because if we multiply it by its transpose, seen here, you can do the computation and find that you get the identity matrix. So this matrix multiplied by its transpose equals the identity. Hence, the matrix and its transpose are inverses, so it's an orthogonal matrix. Of course, if this matrix is orthogonal, so too is its transpose. Here's another example of an orthogonal matrix you should be familiar with. The standard matrix for counterclockwise rotation about the origin in R squared through an angle theta is this orthogonal matrix. We can see it's orthogonal because here it is multiplied by its transpose. And when we do this matrix multiplication, we get cosine squared plus sine squared, which we know is one. Then we would get cosine times sine minus sine times cosine which is zero. Then we would get sine times cosine minus cosine times sine, which is zero. And then finally, we would get sine squared plus cosine squared, which is one. So we get the identity. This rotation matrix multiplied by its transpose gives us the identity. So it is an orthogonal matrix. Another transformation with an orthogonal standard matrix is the reflection operation. The standard matrix for reflection about the XZ plane in R cubed is this matrix, which we can see is orthogonal because if we multiply it by its transpose, which happens to be itself because it's a symmetric matrix, we get the identity. So this matrix is orthogonal. Its inverse is its transpose. Now it's no coincidence that this rotation matrix and this reflection matrix are orthogonal. We'll see a theorem near the end of this video where it's clear why this is the case. For now, let's look at a different theorem concerning the rows and the columns of an orthogonal matrix. This is an important theorem which we will prove. These three statements are equivalent for an n by n matrix A. A is orthogonal. The row vectors of A form an orthonormal basis for Rn with the Euclidean inner product. And the column vectors of A form an orthonormal basis for Rn with the Euclidean inner product. So these are all equivalent. If we know that one is true, the other two must be true as well. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson introducing orthonormal bases. Remember, for a basis to be orthonormal, all of the vectors in the basis must be orthogonal, and they must have a norm of one. They must be unit vectors. To prove this, we'll first show that one and two are equivalent and then we'll show that 1 and 3 are equivalent. So all three statements must be equivalent. For this proof, we're basically going to consider A times A transpose and express it in a way that shows it could only be the identity if the rows form an orthonormal basis for Rn. So we'll basically be knocking out both directions of this equivalence at once. So let's let Ri be the ith row vector of our matrix A, and Cj will be the jth column vector of A transpose. Note that means that each Cj is equal to Rj, since the columns of A transpose are the rows of A. Now we could express A like this, where each of these Ri's represents an entire row. 
We could also represent a transpose like this, where each ci represents an entire column. Then, if we multiply a by a transpose, let's think about what we would get. The first entry would be the first row multiplied by the first column, and we would get that, R1 times C1. The second entry in row 1 would come from row 1 multiplied by column 2, which we see there, and so on. The final entry would be row 1 times CN. Keep in mind that each of these entries is itself a simple matrix multiplication. Row 1 times column 1 looks like this, right? Row 1 matched up with column 1. Once we do that multiplication, we get a single scalar, and similarly for all of these other entries. So hopefully, even with this notation, you can see how we carry out matrix multiplication in the usual way. Row 2, for example, would get matched up with column 1, giving us that entry, and then row 2 times column 2, giving us that entry, and so on. We can populate this whole matrix. But then, each entry in A times A transpose is of this form, Ri times Cj, some row vector of A times some column vector of A transpose. Now, like I said, this is a simple matrix multiplication. It's a row vector times a column vector. We could rewrite this as a dot product if we took the transpose of each column vector Cj. This would be equal to the dot product of Ri and Cj transpose. Because if we take the transpose of Cj, then these are just two row vectors now. So we can take their dot product. And it's going to be the same scalar as this matrix multiplication. But then remember, each Cj is just the jth column vector of A transpose. Hence, if we turn it into a row vector, we have the jth row vector of A. Because the columns of A transpose are the rows of A. So Cj transpose is just Rj. The jth column vector of the transpose is the jth row vector of the original matrix. So we can replace all of these with just Ri dot Rj. So A times A transpose is equal to this matrix, where each entry is a dot product of two row vectors. Row 1 dot row 1, row 2 dot row 2, and so on, row n dot row n, we have each row vector dotted with itself on the main diagonal. Off the diagonal, we have dot products of distinct rows, like R1 dot R2, R1 dot Rn, Rn dot R3 would be in here, and so on. Now remember, for A to be orthogonal, this matrix has to be the identity, which means all of these dot products on the diagonal have to be one, and all of these other dot products off the diagonal have to be zero. That's what it would mean for A to be orthogonal and this product being the identity. And so right there, we have our proof. A times A transpose is going to be the identity, and so A would be orthogonal by definition, if and only if all of these dot products on the diagonal, so R1 dot R1, R2 dot R2, and so on, Rn dot Rn, each of those dot products of a vector with itself have to equal 1, which would mean that the norm of each of those vectors, which is defined as the square root of the dot product of the vector with itself, all of those norms also have to equal 1, because their dot products are 1. That means they're all unit vectors. But then remember, all of those dot products off the diagonal, which are dot products of distinct vectors, ri dot rj when i is not equal to j, all of those would have to be equal to zero. Again, we're talking about when this is the identity, when a is orthogonal. All of those have to equal zero, which means those distinct rows have to be orthogonal. Remember, each ri and rj represents distinct rows, and so if all those dot products are zero, all of those rows of A are orthogonal. So A is orthogonal precisely when its row vectors form an orthonormal basis. A is orthogonal when all of those row vectors have a norm of 1, and distinct row vectors are all orthogonal 
orthogonal to each other. And so we've proven this equivalence that a matrix is orthogonal if and only if its row vectors form an orthonormal basis for Rn. What remains to be proven is the equivalence of 1 and 3. Now this is just like what we just proved, except we're proving something about the columns instead of the rows. Here it is written out. This time we're trying to make a conclusion about the column vectors of A, so we split A up into its column vectors and split A transpose up into its rows. But then to do the multiplication, A times A transpose, if we really want to use this notation, we need to be able to match up these rows with those columns. And so to do that, we have to do A transpose times A. But we can preserve the equality if we just take the transpose of that swapped product. So instead of A times A transpose, we put A transpose first so that we can match up those row vectors with those column vectors. And then whatever that is, we'll take the transpose of that so that we didn't actually change anything. Equality is preserved. So then we would match up rows with columns, do that matrix multiplication, and we would get this matrix as A transpose times A, and then we have to take the transpose of that. But in fact, that transpose doesn't actually matter, because you may recall, a matrix times its own transpose is always symmetric. So this product is equal to the transpose of the product. I'll leave a link in the description to the video where we go over that fact. A matrix times its transpose is symmetric. So this transpose operator doesn't actually do anything. Then just like in the previous proof where we pointed out the column vectors of A transpose are the row vectors of A, in this proof, we show that the row vectors of A transpose are the column vectors of A, and so we replace each Ri with Ci. And then we go through similar reasoning as before to show that this matrix is going to be the identity if and only if all of the column vectors, C1 through Cn, form an orthonormal basis. So that establishes the equivalence of all three of these statements. A matrix is orthogonal, that's equivalent to its row vectors being an orthonormal basis for Rn, and same thing for its column vectors. Here is another theorem of basic properties of orthogonal matrices. I'll leave a link in the description to a lesson where we prove these. They're a little more straightforward than the previous theorem. The transpose of an orthogonal matrix is orthogonal, which we already mentioned. The product of two orthogonal matrices is orthogonal. The inverse of an orthogonal matrix is orthogonal. Of course, that's the same as saying its transpose is orthogonal. And more interestingly, the determinant of an orthogonal matrix is positive one or negative one. Those are the only possibilities. Here's an example, the determinant of this orthogonal matrix that we looked at earlier. Its determinant, we can compute easily, is one half minus negative one half, which is positive one. Now, if we swap rows, so let's take this row with that negative and move it down to row 2, that's going to have the effect of just making the determinant now negative 1. Perhaps you recall how swapping rows influences determinants. But if we swap these rows, we still have an orthogonal matrix, except this time the determinant is negative 1. And for an orthogonal matrix, those are the only two possibilities. The determinant could be positive 1 or negative 1. And note how swapping rows in a matrix certainly doesn't change whether or not those rows form an orthonormal basis. Hence, swapping rows from an orthogonal matrix will not change the fact that the matrix is orthogonal. Lastly, this theorem sheds some light on the orthogonal transformation matrices that we saw earlier. The following are equivalent for an n by n matrix A. A being orthogonal is equivalent to the norm of A times X equaling the norm of X for all X in Rn. So if we view an orthogonal matrix as a transformation, it is specifically a transformation which does not affect the norm of a vector in Rn. 
Also, it's equivalent to this property 3 here. Ax dot Ay is equal to x dot y. So an orthogonal transformation doesn't change dot products. x dot y is going to be the same as Ax dot Ay if A is an orthogonal matrix. So from statements 2 and 3 here, which are both equivalent to a matrix being orthogonal, we see that the orthogonal operators on Rn are precisely the operators that leave dot products and norms unchanged. That means they leave angles and distances unchanged. Some transformations that do that are rotations and reflections, so it's not surprising that the standard matrix for those transformations would be orthogonal. And remember, the connection to angles comes from the fact that the angle between two vectors is defined in terms of the dot product. So if an orthogonal transformation doesn't change dot products between vectors, which we see here, it is also the case that it doesn't change the angle between the vectors. And you might think, wait a minute, isn't that exactly what a rotation transformation does? It changes the angle. But remember, we're thinking about the transformation applied to the entire vector space Rn. So all these vectors are receiving that transformation. If all of those vectors rotate, then the angles they have between each other are not changed at all. And the distances between them and their individual norms are not changed either. So that's a bit about orthogonal matrices. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my Linear Algebra course and Linear Algebra Exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to additional videos, practice, and if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes used in this course. Thanks for watching. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about. Mama. Stressed out, honey, I've been stressed out lately. Don't know what's what, don't know what I'm stressed about. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about.